Hello, Bezel333 here. The other day I was trying to record a TV program on my computer. I say try it because it didn't work. All I got was a fuzzy like snow, but I did get some audio, and here's a clip of it. <laughs> Now, I don't know if I inadvertently tuned in to another dimension or not, but I do know one thing. That is one creepy sound, and it makes me think of how demons might talk to one another. you got to admit that that sound is unsettling, no matter what caused it. And you wouldn't want to listen to it very long, because it's uncomfortable, and we tend to avoid things that are uncomfortable. But today I want to talk about something very uncomfortable, and something we'd much rather avoid, and that is the reality of eternal punishment. Now, although it's uncomfortable, the reality of a coming judgment and eternal punishment, uh, if it is for real, if, if the Bible's correct in what it says, then the most loving and kind thing a person can do for someone else is to alert them to the danger that they are in every moment of every day by rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, first, I want to suggest that the major backdrop uh, behind the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament writings is the reality of a coming judgment and eternal punishment for those who are finally weighed in the balance of God's justice and found wanting. You know, Matthew 10, 28, we read, And do not fear those who can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but fear him who is able to throw both soul and body in hell. Keep in mind that this was not uh, spoken by some hardline 16th century theologian, but by Jesus Christ himself. And to save sinners from the wrath of God and eternal punishment from God, uh, that is the paramount purpose of the New Testament writings. We find this in, the, in uh, Paul's writing, 1 Timothy 1.15, For Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. You know, the Apostle John in his Gospel has much to say about the reality of eternal punishment. That famous verse that you see uh, placarded at football games and so forth, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This everlasting life that John speaks of is, is for those who believe on the Lord Jesus. But what of the person who does not believe? Well, John goes on, he says, for, um, he says, he who believes on him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then he ends that chapter uh, with these very sobering words. He writes, he who believes on the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. So many of the parables that Jesus used to teach indicate that there will be a separation between two categories of people. For instance, in Matthew 13, we have the parable of the wheat and the weeds. The end of that parable says, Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the weeds and bind them into bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my granary. See, we have a separation. How about the parable of the net that catches uh, the fish? Uh, Jesus likens the kingdom to this net that was cast into the sea. And when it was full, they brought it to the shore, and they gathered the good fish and threw away the bad. Uh, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. We have two um, categories of people here. The wise virgins who brought oil, the unwise or the foolish virgins that didn't bring extra oil for their lamps. When the bridegroom comes, they have to go out and buy oil. They come back, the wedding has already started, the door is shut. And finally, he says to them, when they ask to come in, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. We also have the unprofitable servant in uh, Matthew chapter 25. And remember, we have two servants that did well with what was given to them by the, uh, the Lord. And then we have one servant who didn't do anything with what he was given. And at the very end, he says to this unprofitable servant, Throw him out and cast them into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You could perhaps argue that parables are difficult to interpret and could have many different meanings. 
Okay, so let's go to Matthew 25, the very end of the chapter, when Jesus is talking about the separation of the sheep and the goats. He's talking about when he comes back in his glory to judge uh, the, li the living and the dead. And he says that these on his right uh, that, that did these things to the least of them, and he says, in doing that, you were doing it to me. He says, these will go into everlasting life. But the people on his left that didn't do these things to the least of them, uh, and weren't doing them to Jesus, will go into eternal punishment. But let's go back to that uh, parable of the, uh, the fish and the net, the, the large net. He says this, he says, And so it shall be at the end of the world. The angels shall come and separate the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. When Jesus was nearing the end of his life and he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, feeling the agony and the torment of, of knowing what was coming, he prayed to his father. He said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Remember, Jesus was quite familiar with the Hebrew scriptures and knew all too well what the cup of God's wrath was. In, in, we find this in, in Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel talking about God's fury being compared to having to drink this cup of bitter wine that would be more and more distasteful as you got lower and lower in getting those bitter particles at the very bottom. You know, uh, what Jesus endured, although finite in time, was of infinite value to the Father in satisfying his justice against sin which is an infinite offense to a infinitely holy and righteous God. And, and the question I want to ask you is, who will suffer for your sins? Is it going to be you suffering for eternity, a debt that you'll never be able to pay? Or will you trust in the one who provided a sacrifice and a, an atonement that was acceptable to the Father, was a sweet-smelling sacrifice to him, who really did cause uh, an atonement and a propitiation, uh, that, that sweet-smelling aroma that takes away God's wrath. Who will suffer for your sins? My friends, God's judgments are coming. Uh, today is the day of salvation. Today is the acceptable day of the Lord. Look at yourself and see yourself for who you really are. See your sin and imperfection when weighed against the perfect righteousness and holiness of God. See your unworthiness before God. And then see God's goodness in giving you time to repent and respond to the free offer of God's grace in Jesus Christ. Take heed and know that the one who dies rejecting the Savior will forever in shame and guilt be rejecting Jesus Christ forever and ever. And once death occurs, it will be too late. There will be no second chances. The words of Paul in 2 Corinthians are so appropriate here, and I echo them right now. I beseech you, in Christ, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And I want to leave you with some words from C.S. Lewis's book, The Weight of Glory. He writes, It's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and corruption, such as you now meet only, maybe, in a nightmare. There are no ordinary people. It's immortals who we joke with, work with, marry and snub, immortal horrors, or everlasting splendors. <laughs>